Welcome to the Cross Canada Spotlight. I'm Mike Arsenault. Every week we take a look at some of the most interesting and entertaining stories produced across the Global News Network. Our first story this week starts in British Columbia, but will end up around the globe. It's a family vacation taken to a whole different level. The porters are packing up for a family trip, but the kids never expected this. Dad wondered if anyone wanted to spend 14 months flying around the world. I thought my dad was joking. At first, I didn't really think that it was actually a plausible idea. I didn't think that they were being serious about it. So you didn't want to just load up the family van and go to Kelowna for the summer. <laughs> That's not really our style. <laughs> Ian Porter has done some long adventure flights before, but this journey will take them all over the globe. 70,000 kilometers with stops in over 50 countries. Flying is the easy part. The bigger challenge is, is logistics of moving a family of five around the world with no set place to stay each night. Last year, Samantha and Sydney both got their pilot's license, so they'll be helping out at the controls. My dad is chief pilot and my sister and I will be flying co-pilot. The motto for this journey is low and slow, usually only two and a half hours in the air, so no questions about how much longer until they get there from the back seats. But there will be some very long days together. I'm sure there'll be some bickering here or there, and some of us will unplug the headsets, I'm sure. They'll be visiting towns and villages along the way and hoping to raise a million dollars for SOS Children's Villages, which provide safe homes for vulnerable children. They also offer uh, humanitarian assistance in, in uh, emergency situations, such as in Ukraine. The girls are taking a year off school. Brother Christopher will study online, all saying goodbye to friends who can't believe what they're doing. Thinking that we're crazy. <laughs> Definitely my friends think <laughs> that this is an insane adventure. Oh, you. But the stories they'll be able to tell everyone when they get home next year from the ultimate getaway. The porters may have just peaked when it comes to family vacations. And I'm not thinking of topping this yet. I don't know if we can top it, but first thing, we had to do it first. <laughs> then we'll worry about topping it. <laughs> Jay Durant, Global News. I feel like there will be multiple moments during that journey of the parents will have to whisper quietly to themselves, we're raising money for charity, we're raising money for charity. I'm sure it will be an incredible journey, but those are incredibly close quarters. I don't think my family could pull it off, but kudos to the porters. Next up, an antique roll of film that was restored by a BC photography expert and the search for the people in the pictures almost 100 years later. 47 years in photography has presented Jim Solos with a few challenges. He saved a number of lost rolls of film and restored dozens of vintage cameras. So this is the actual film. But nothing like the task he just took yeah, on when he developed. tried to revive a film uh, almost 100 years uh, old that was uh, discovered at a Vancouver uh, antique store. I was pretty much convinced myself this was a lost cause. There, there's no way this could possibly work. With a little research and a lot of guesswork, Solos oh, brought back to life astounded. three pictures with it's faded images. My heart skipped a beat at that point. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Now he had a mystery on his hands. When and where were these taken? And who are the people posing? His social media followers started offering some clues on the era. And some people even saw stuff that I didn't see. The truck, the bike tire, the old washing machine, and a sweater with an image from the 1924 Winter Olympics in France. Slowly the puzzle started to take shape. But we still didn't know who these people were. What a local mystery it was, hey? Newspapers picked up the story. Canada. It appeared in Canada, the US, and even the UK. And then Jim got a message from a woman in Edmonton who saw the article. I realized that it was my family and I was, it's like winning the lottery. Pamela Bonner has been working on her family tree and immediately recognized the baby. It was her grandmother, Lorraine. Just the eyes and, the, and just the way she looked. Smiling for the camera along with three generations of family members at their White Rock Farm in 1926. Bringing all these people back to life. Chances of actually finding anybody, it was a million to one. And Mystery back, solved thanks to the article, the, uh, Solo's expertise, the, uh, and the help of hundreds of online detectives. Just everything that's come together, the way the stars align for us to be able to, to discover these people again. Such unexpected success that maybe it's time to open up a new mystery role revival business. I'm retired now, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it'd be fun to, to have that happen again. Jay Durant, Global News. I am a sucker for stories like this. It's just so cool that our interconnected world can make it so easy for Jim and Pamela to get in touch with each other. 
Pamela mentioned, it's like winning, uh, winning the lottery. I'm sure getting her hands on those photos is just priceless. We're going to stick with the found object theme, but now we're going to head east to Ontario for a story on how two guitars thought to be lost forever made their way back into the right hands. It's overwhelming. I mean, I literally thought I would never see my dad's guitar again. I wouldn't see either one of them. It was last December that Donna Mountenay's garage was broken into and two vintage guitars were stolen. One belonged to her late father and the other to her husband's late brother. Needless to say, they had great sentimental value. The regent belonged to my father. My mother had bought it for him as a birthday present back in 1969. And all of us kids learned to play on that guitar. Dad treasured that guitar. So the thought after 53 years of it being in the family and someone else's hands being on it was killing me. Her father's 1964 Regent was so well loved, it even held his fingerprints in the neck of the guitar. There's no money that you can place on memories and, and when you don't have those people with you, it becomes all the more precious. Mountain a reported the break and enter to Kingston police, and now six months later, a long awaited update. Since the guitars were recovered by police, further investigation revealed that the individual that sold the instruments to the hawk shop has since passed away. So that kind of wraps up the case. There won't be any charges, obviously, and uh, the owner is just grateful to be giving them back in her, into her possession. In some small way, I felt like I left my dad down by losing it and it it was killing me so when he told me he had them back he had to sit there and listening to me crying <laughs> yeah, but they were happy tears happy tears the guitars are now in police custody and will be back with mountain a as soon as tuesday night megan king global news kingston now that's a happy ending for donna and those cherished guitars switching gears now heading back to school dalhousie university to be exact for a story about how a group of very smart students and their creation of a nano satellite. So yeah, this is uh, this is Loris. Twenty um, centimeters again, tall, ten centimeters wide, centimeters and tall. weighing in just under two kilograms, this nano satellite is ready to blast off into space. We are obviously so excited and cannot wait for it to send us the first signal. LORA stands for Low Orbit Reconnaissance Imagery Satellite. It's a project out of Dalhousie University's Space Systems Lab and part of the Canadian CubeSat project funded by the Canadian Space Agency. LORA's is one of 15 CubeSats being built across the country, but it's among the first to be completed. It's a surreal feeling because, um, again, it's been four years that really encapsulated everyone's life to some extent. Loris will go on a resupply mission to the International Space Station. Once on board, the plan is to launch Loris into orbit sometime around November. Loris's main mission, to test new technologies that haven't yet seen the darkness of space. A lot of research has gone into Loris, anywhere from battery research into material research and, and software and mechanical. So one of the things Loris will do is it will bring that research into space and then we can actually see how it performs. Around 250 students worked on Loris, including Lucas Rollins, an engineering student who helped create the satellite's electronic power system. It's exciting to know that it's going to be launched and stuff we worked on and touched is going to be orbiting the Earth. This is how the boards are uh, stacked up. The project the leader says uh, nanosatellites are the new wave of space exploration and he hopes funding for future projects like this will continue. More we can do of this, more we can learn and more technologies can come out of Canada that uh, again we desperately need to be competitive on this landscape right now. Loris will visit the Canadian Space Agency in Quebec before being shipped off to Texas for the big countdown. Ashley Field, Global News, Halifax. The engineering capability necessary to create something like that just flies over my head. I definitely wasn't doing anything nearly as impressive as those students when I was in university. My main concern back then was how many dollar beers I could buy at the bar each week. So it's probably a good thing I wasn't involved in any projects that involved sending something to space. Our last story of the week takes us to the forest, the Halliburton Forest in Ontario. Global News Weekend's editor Nikki Knight is producing a series called Off the Beaten Path, which takes a look at cool areas across the country that may be unknown to many. Here's her latest effort. The Halliburton Forest Wolf Center is an all-indoors education facility. 
The Wolf Center first opened in July of 1996. Our wolves here, we currently have six of them. They live in an enclosure that's just over seven acres in size. So quite a good chunk of land for them to run around in. Any zoo you go to, you get to see the animal. But here the idea is we really want to learn about the animal and see them in their natural environment, to see some of those behaviors that you don't really see when humans start interfering. So we don't touch or interact at all. When you come to the Wolf Center, you can expect to uh, have a peek out of our one-way windows, like what's behind me here. Um, and see some wolves roaming around outside the window there. There goes Piper, our alpha male, actually, right now. Our wolves eat about once every five to 10 days, and they're eating a mixture of deer, moose, beaver. The deer and the moose comes from local roadkill. For a group of six wolves, one good-sized deer, or about one beaver per wolf, we'll feed them for about a week. Wolves are a keystone predator. You take away that pillar, everything under it collapses. So learning about these animals such that we're no longer afraid of them helps us to better coexist with them and manage our own actions that we're not disturbing nature's way and we can appreciate it instead. I like how the center keeps a clear distinction between the guests and the wolves. The guests aren't able to infringe on the wolves habitat and the animals can stay as wild as possible as nature intended. They really are beautiful animals. Nice work, Nikki. Okay, that's it for the Cross Canada Spotlight this week. Be sure to watch Global News Weekend Saturday and Sunday mornings at 7 a.m. on the Global TV app and Prime Video.